Yeah, I plan after we've just had that session. I plan to do uh, some this weekend and then m most of it next week. Come on, nights. I'd say I love to have a job where you can just do your uni work while you're at work. Well, <laughs> yeah, I have to make sure I do pop my head out every now and again, but majority of it will be done next week. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, okay. Um, are you enjoying being back at work, Ashley? Yeah, I am, to be fair. It's a bit boring being off, but especially when you've got yeah. nothing to do. I know. Oh, like, and you're locked yeah, up. <laughs> Mm, it's not good, is it? I'll be looking gosh. forward to tomorrow. I see what's happening then. Yes, I'm back, six I'm back hours in, in the morning eight. with Aid. Oh, how nice. <laughs> I'm going to come off afternoons onto mornings tomorrow. I'm going to sit him on my lap like Santa's little kid. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, final session that we've got, uh, and it's learning outcome three that we're looking at now. So we've looked in the first learning. So everyone's done um, learning outcome one, which is really good. Um, last week we looked at within your team how to make sure you got the right skills and got the right experience. And now we're looking at techniques to achieve success. Some of them, there is some reiteration from last week. So don't if you do want to use the same sort of techniques or um, theories twice, it's absolutely fine. You've just got to repurpose them for what specifically we're asking the assessment of this assessment criteria. Um, so in terms, so this is only short, okay, they're always short, but 350 words, you're probably talking two or three paragraphs. Um, how do you measure or monitor um, an individual's performance so or a team performance? What measures in place at work where you in your roles well you've got metrics so you've got kpis so okay. that they'll, they'll be recorded on a document or in an area to make sure uh, see how they're delivering against those kpis so it might be certain amount of products per hour per week okay. cer certain amount of cost saving certain amount of ideas or kaizans you know reduced accidents so you'll have those kpis and that'll be part of their daily performance Individuals themselves, um, you could monitor that through objectives. So they could be personal objectives, you know, objectives that we've set them, organisational objectives. And again, by having performance reviews and regular one-to-ones, you can discuss how they're getting a, a, on against those targets. So you've got so you, the organisational ones, and then they're sort of to a team, and then they're individual, aren't they? So they're all sort of filtered yeah. through. This okay. is a bit similar to 1.3, isn't it? Oh, Analyzing strategy for managing <laughs> team leaders. <laughs> and just like pick an assessment criteria. That's what I mean. And then when you look at actually what they're genuinely looking for, sometimes they just took the same models. And you're like, well, yeah, I agree. Um, but this is more sort of output based. This isn't. So if we just to sort of contextualise, so we can see um, what the difference is between them. The first one is how we're going to develop, manage, and lead. So it's like looking forward. The second one is make sure we've got the right people, and this one is about taking it to the next level. So that, that I suppose that's the the theory is this is about building on what's already going well. But yes, you're absolutely right. It is really similar. Um, how do you do it then, Antonia? How would you? Well, individual um, performance would be very much against the objective and see whether, you know, obviously you're meeting them and well, you're obviously not, why not? And maybe maybe they're the wrong objective. So, you know, create a conversation around that. Um, on a team level, it would be very much seeing whether the, the you know, is the service running smoothly? Where are the hiccups? um what's the waiting list like that's always a big indicator okay and is that an indicator of what of what exactly of things not running smoothly so it... obviously the initial outset is that you would have it organized to a degree that there wouldn't be a build up a waiting list um that you would stay within the sort of two weeks response window etc cetera, etc cetera. and if you're not if you're not doing that there's there are obviously issues okay um and could it ever be that there's a demand and supply issue that you're under resourced? Would that ever be a factor? What, what do you mean? So, so if you've got a, a long waiting list, is it ever because there's more? It's about resource that you haven't got enough resource, rather than yeah, 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 yeah. That would definitely yeah. 
it, yeah, it depends, I suppose, why there is a waiting list. I'm just saying if there's been some sort of promotional campaign and students know about you and they didn't before, then you'd expect that to be. Exactly. And they're in flux times, like, um, you know, obviously the beginning of term um, when, you know, students return from the last year or when new students are declared mental health difficulties, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you do have your sort of push times. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. Um, Ashley, anything to add from your sort of experience? No, the same as what Aid said, really. You're it's so lucky studying with well, Aid, aren't you? Hmm. I think I'd, I'd always want to be studying with him because he'll always answer really well. Hmm. <laughs> Just enjoy and make notes. Um, have you ever heard of Stephen Covey and the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? No. Uh, you just, you're yeah. so young, that's why. Hmm. Did, did Antonia say yes? Yeah. You have? Yeah. Oh, thank God. Um, and... Adrian's it's a classic, a, isn't it? It is a classic, yeah. It was like one of those of its time, wasn't it? It was the sort of thing to read. Um, and did you read it? Um, bits and pieces. I didn't really cover to cover, but I read some of it, yeah. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I bought it at the time. So I've got these um, sort of strategies in terms of, and actually I think they are very much still um, of, of their, yeah, well, just have a flick through them, see if you think they're still relevant. I don't know where he's gone. <laughs> Do you think they're still as relevant today as they were as 30 years ago? I think, yeah. It's pretty much how we try to sort of run it here, really. In certain areas of the business where you need motivated, driven people, you're pretty much looking at them seven aspects yeah. of where they should be driving that shouldn't you? you know they know where they're going they know what the end is they think of what what's the quick win situations that you can achieve first etc i think there's also a real sense here of um, responsibility isn't there and taking responsibility for yourself and like ownership of things which i think is um a key i suppose to um, being successful in your career i think well in all aspects isn't it um, okay, so we've got, um, so that you could refer to that if you wanted to. I mentioned before, and I'm sure, so when Adrian's talked about how he's done the performance management, because you have got mid-year reviews, haven't you, at JLR, but then Adrian tries to do them between that as well, but then Ashley doesn't, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got this process. How often do you have reviews, Antonia? Mm. Six every six months. So I yeah, think. so it's the, the mid year as well, isn't it? Yeah, mid year and end of year that'd be. Yeah, yeah. Um, Although we do have we do have a monthly meetings, um, which I can sort of they're booked in the diary, but we can you know I can say actually I don't really need it, or my land manager can say there's no need, and then that's fine. Okay. Um. So yeah, and those would be potentially your progress reviews, wouldn't they, on a, a sort of more ad hoc basis. So yeah, so we've got this sort of um, cycle that we're quite familiar with. There's another way. Um, smart objectives, have you heard a lot about using these? Yeah. You seem to do them to death. Antonia, are you really familiar with them as well? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, when you genuinely set yourself, do you set any objectives for yourself? Yeah, we have to set two for ourselves. Our manager wants us to do. They set us three and we normally set ourselves two. And do you check against this to make sure they are this? Yes. I don't... They, they should all be. They drive them to be smart objectives. Yeah. OK. Because um... they, they, they used to be a time where managers put in objectives that were running because so basically our performance and, and rating is based on our objectives but some managers would put in objectives that you couldn't achieve and then you'd end up scoring poorly at the end of year which then would link into you getting a poor payment at the end of the year for your bonus and, and were they doing that were yes up, you, oh wow wow so that's, if, you, yeah. if you if your manager didn't like you he would set you an objective just so you would have no no chance the amount of process leaders I had at Castle Bomb that would just go, I'm never going to get it, I'm never going to do that, 
I'm always going to be bottom again because that's just unachievable. There was a fashion some time ago, um, and this was because uh, I, I remember it was about sort of 17 years ago. There was something called stretch objectives were fashionable because uh, like management tends to have these like fads and things. And, and stretch, stretch objectives were meant to be like achievable, but pushed you a bit. So it weren't achievable. We've got it on our scorecard. What, a stretch objective? It's called a stretch target. So what did we achieve last year? And what do you want to get to this year? What's the gap? What's the difference? They're not unachievable though for us. We can. They are still achievable. Yeah, we, we're always told to make our stretch target that's actually going to be, you know, an achievable and worthwhile uh, improvement. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think when people use this, especially on the top of degree, they tend to go for each thing. They do a separate, so they do like a separate sentence for specific, a separate sentence for measurable. But I think if you want to use this really well, it's just one sentence, one really simple sentence, but it, it has all of those aspects to it. So when you're setting the SMART objectives, is it a really simple thing that you say or is it really detailed? Can you give me an example of, of a SMART objective that you're working towards, for example? Uh, so a SMART objective for me is, um, so all the plastic element of a vehicle, so your bumpers, your door handles, is to increase the FTT, so the first time through by 5%. So at the minute, at about every 75 out of 100 components will go through and be sold. The other 25 will end up being repaired. So my objective by this year is to increase that by another five. So 80 will go through first time and only 20 repaired. Okay. And and do you feel that's achievable? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah. It was not it, it sounds easy. It, it sounds like it, but we're talking like the thousands here. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. and and it's by the end of this year, you said. Is that so right? So it'll be by uh April. Okay. Yeah, so we run yeah, fiscal year. Um, it is specific because there's actual numbers involved, aren't there, in terms of yeah. target, and it's measurable. Yeah. Achievable, you're saying? Do you think it is? It yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And I like this idea, instead of just realistic, I like the relevant because actually it is relevant to your business function, isn't it? So you get yeah. why you'd have to do it. So that's that's a perfect example. So yeah, that that. so I think smart objectives work really well. I think what we heard about from last week when Brenna was talking about um, her KPIs being introduced, so late in the day what what did you think about that you, you sort of you set to fail a little bit i think in some aspects it's just not like with the, if we're looking at it from a sort of almost like an innocent point of view it's just something they've overlooked and realized they've got to get right but actually how can you be working towards something that you've not been told <laughs> yeah um and by putting it so late in the year you ain't got a chance to achieve it for the end of the year well, that sounds, in my mind, that's almost as bad as what you were saying about um, the manager setting you up to fail, isn't it? It's the same yeah. thing. Separate intent behind it or not, but that that was just horrible. Um, Adrian and Ashley, I'm sorry, because it just feels like we're repeating things, but they have a certain relevance to them um, in terms of like just using them in different ways. So how would a balanced scorecard be relevant to individual and team performance why why would you use it because it shows where you are you can visually see where you are whether you measure it week by week or day by day or month by month and what area of the business needs additional focus or you know where's performing well in the business and just shows you where needs addressing where needs um, support absolutely why why would you have a balance of these different elements rather than just focusing on your uh, throughput of a, the sort of parts been right first time why would you why would they use a balanced scorecard approach because you can see everything you're not just focusing on one single area yeah i think it is so so antonio have you heard of them before because i'm just conscious of taught actually an agent not times. really no no right I think they're quite good because what they do is, if you're not careful, say say um, a very much an output focused organisation like JLR would really look at finances, quality, turnover. But the reason you'd have a balanced scorecard is this four key elements that you're looking at in the organisation. So you are looking at the money, you're making sure that actually you're delivering, you know, because you've got to be sustainable. 
but actually in terms of internal processes how are you con contributing that to those so actually we're making sure this business is streamlined innovation and learning if we've got objectives around that that puts something in the bank for the future that makes sure that we can be um, best in class it makes sure that we're future looking and then a customer's perspective in theory you know an organization is only to be marketing led you've, you've got to really take it from a customer point of view so jll have their um customers first is that right person customers customer first, first. yeah yes yeah so they have these different elements so so the idea is if we have a blend and our measurements are connected to these four different aspects then we should have a really nice way of looking at developing an individual from a number of perspectives not just as a machine so um i think it's in the cu organization it's more based on developments based on our strategic pillars yeah yeah it's quite difficult to you know translate into into the counseling world or you know even yeah, the wider picture. But, but say that, isn't it? Because actually, um, I think they're trying to. I think they're trying to look across a number of measures. But actually, some of the strategic pillars um, may not be as relevant to the counselling arena than others. So there are going to be. There's got to be scope to adapt, isn't there? And what are the strategic pillars? You'll find you know? them on. Um, Probably start them, it, yeah, you'll find them in the corporate plan. Um, they are things like internationalisation. Um, they, so the guy who writes the corporate plan, I met him last week. Have you met, ever heard of him? Five winters. Say that again. You won't have heard. Uh, yeah, I just wondered if you heard. <laughs> it's actually so nice. Uh, Antonio, have you, ever, <laughs> have, you, have you ever heard of Five Winters? No. No, he wrote he writes the strategic plan is very isn't very nice um right so they've got six core values in the strategic plan and then they've got um yeah things like globalization um i don't know states it is all yeah 2000 they're, they're launching the 2030 corporate plan shortly so you could look at it there and just see if they're aligned with what you do you don't have to, but it just might be interesting to see if there's. No, no, no. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm definitely gonna, gonna have a look. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will. Yeah, just put in the. Uh, because you've sent me some chat messages before, haven't you? Here we go. I'll just send you a link to the, the one Antonia at the moment. Okay. okay thanks. Yep. Okay. Um. So we've got um. Different things we can look at here. Right. So this is um. 350 words so that's nothing is it so we can't do and sort of it says techniques so we need to do more than one so i'd suggest we just do two um smart objectives are really straightforward you've mentioned kpis scorecards sound like they'd work for the jlr environment you could look at um alignment to strategic pillars as a, an equivalent for um the cu way and then there's quite a lot of things here that work very well in the manufacturing sort of environment so error rates outputs etc slas um but antonio you could you mentioned about waiting lists and things like that has been a way because that's output based as well isn't it um yeah. to flag up so i think we've got lots to say for a very limited word count um are you all comfortable with that one yeah it's really straightforward isn't it um okay um so moving on uh we've got so 325 words for each of these uh good practice for enabling and supporting high performance teams and then motivational techniques for high performing teams um so um have you ever heard of something called jihari's window no okay i'm going to show you it's quite interesting have you Antonio, I bet you have. Yeah, I have. I have, and I can't quite. I can't quite access it. Yeah, when you're talking about it, it's going to come okay, back. Okay, we'll definitely... go through it in a second. It's, it's really, it's quite interesting. Um, so I was looking at. I was running a session last week in London. Although no students turned up, so that isn't running a session, is it? I preferred a session, um, mm. and it looked at the seven characteristics of um, 
of entrepreneurs, actually really, really successful entrepreneurs. And one of them is really good self-knowledge, because if you know your own limitations and things, then you can deliver, can't you? You know what you're about and, and you accept those as well. So the idea with Johari's window is um, we've got four different aspects to it. Um, we've got what we show other people and what we know about ourselves. Um, so actually, um, the things that we share quite openly are our arena. So these are things I'd say, I think, Adrian, you're quite open. Would you say you are? Yes. Yeah, I think so. You're like quite an open book. Are you open with everyone or are you quite selective? Yeah. Ever? yeah. OK. Um, and what are the benefits of being that way? Uh, everyone can come and talk to me like open mindedly and free from any sort of fear of what I'm going to say back. Okay. And I get to know a lot of what's going on as well. And I'm honest with them about what's going on within the business and within our areas anyway. Yeah. So it's sort of reciprocated, I suppose, isn't it? There's a trust thing that comes from being open. Um, Antonia, are you open? Like, how much do you feel you put out there in the arena box? I think for me, it very much depends who it's with yeah. um, and what the context is. So I would yeah. be, yeah, yeah, it depends. OK, yeah. And Ashley, what would you say you are in terms of how yeah. big, big your arena is? is I'm, I'm, uh, I'd say I'm open as well. I uh, okay. talk to anybody, anybody will come talk to me. Yeah. Problems, uh, solutions, that sort of stuff. OK, that's yeah, good. Um, the reason, right. So with this, we have and you'll you'll be aware of people like this. So is there are things where people sometimes aren't aware that they do something and it's almost something that everyone around them is aware that they do and it can be um like, like for example I was trying to think because I was I was going through this the slides for this this morning and looking at what we were going to cover and there was a session around really recently but I don't think it was with you but I'm not sure because you're the only people that have been teaching recently did anyone talk about someone they work with who hadn't got a high level of self self-confidence so they were just awful to everyone it was a woman there someone was talking about someone and basically it's their, their blind spots this person isn't aware that they're just they come across as really aggressive to work with and where it comes from is actually they feel really out of their comfort zone they feel like they're being challenged a lot but they're not aware of it so actually people don't warm to them very much and think they've got a bit of a chip on the shoulder but all it is if you look here it's their blind spot so they don't they don't realize everyone else can see that they're a certain way but they can't see it themselves mm. does that make sense it's similar to sort of a conversation i've had with one of our supervisors and, and sort of boosts his confidence he's good at his job but he doesn't think he's good at his job uh, okay yeah um so the blind spot can create problems because if it's something um that's sort of really negative towards you. Basically, if you're not aware of it, you can't handle it, you can't get any support for it. Um, and also it could almost be something that's then used against you and you're not even aware, you know, that you're providing evidence for it. So I think the blind spot's quite a dangerous sort of, you want to keep that as, as small as you can really. Um, then we've got the facade. So this can be where you almost, um, acting a bit so people who always come across as really sort of jovial and really happy but actually you know they might have quite a lot going on but you they don't want to share it uh and, and for good reasons as well you know they don't feel it's something they want to bring into the workplace or anything but um when when could that create problems if they if people have got quite a large facade going on when stress arrives facade will crumble yeah when you put a bit too much on and you're not aware of what else is going on you might light like a fuse and you just don't know um what that tipping point is do you um no. and and people can be um very um yeah they don't they don't necessarily want to share and maybe it might even be that they're in denial about certain things but um yeah that it's i think they the environment that Adrian and Ashley you try and create with your management style, the 
the bigger the arena, the more likely you are to be aware of stuff that's going on that will impact people, which is really helpful, isn't it? Because then you can manage accordingly. Yeah. Um, and then the unknown, the way I describe this is, you know, when people explain they've got red flags, and I don't know if you've got, I think we've all got them, where you have things that sometimes they're like, you press it and it just is a disproportionate reaction. But you don't always know why it is. But there's something. Does that make sense? So there's something about it that we don't. We're not sure. So we don't necessarily deal with. But it's something that just um, is like a trigger in some way. Does that make sense? Do you know? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what point? So if people are getting counselling, Antonio, where do they tend to? Is it tend to be things they know? Is it tend to be in the arena or is it more the unknown that they get counselling for? Or doesn't it really relate to this at all? Mm, no, no, it does. I think it does. Um, I'm. It's hard to say because it depends on the person who's coming through the door. Some people yeah. are, you know, very self-aware and, and may even know what they don't know. They just don't know how to solve it. Yeah. Or okay. they may, you know, they may, it may be something that they're completely unaware of. And then obviously it's part of uncovering that. Um, yeah. So it really just depends. Sometimes facade as well, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because they can be masking things then, can't they, through the facade? Exactly. I'd probably say the arena is probably the least. Yeah. Because uh, that, that tends to be the things that you accept you've got out there and that's you sort of thing. But yeah, uh, it tends to be the other areas, I think, where you get. Um, and and the unknown is almost when you get to a certain level where you want to find out even more and you're quite interested in exploring things but you tend to be quite self-confident I think if you want to explore that level quite um, so what's the benefit so let's go going back to this thing about enabling and supporting high performing teams how, how does Jahari's window what insights does that give you to allow you to do that to allow you to, to help your team perform even higher I would say that as as a manager, it'd be helpful to be somewhat aware. Well, certainly aware of yourself, where you are, because obviously, if you're not going to be aware, it can create a lot of problems. But also, I suppose, um, within the team and being aware and able to pinpoint some of those things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's quite a good one to just understand the yeah where where other people will be at with this and do you think feedback could help illuminate some of the blind spots that people might have absolutely yeah that's probably the main way i would i would suggest um that yeah through in fact actually I, where did i read that i think that was in one of the books oh yeah yeah it was one of the books that i read for the first bit um or one of the journals or whatever and there was you know some some techniques around team building etc um and being and there's a name to it you may be probably aware of it um allowing everybody to say one write down one word for um the manager to start with um about their weakness or that yeah, sorry about their strength and okay. then the area of improvement and then you, the manager's going to be first and then it sort of goes around the room um and obviously you know it's not meant to be vicious it's meant to be very helpful and in, in, in a sort of creative way to get people talking yeah. um, and team building etc um so yeah that might be might be one of the ways to overcome some of the blind spots and and create a bit more awareness really because I, th I think the idea with a high performing team is the more you can get the more the bigger people's arena the better because that allows you to just be more and more open and just be more authentic in wherever you're working, isn't it? And feel safe in what you're doing. Um, we had an example, didn't we, last week, which was talking about development techniques. And one of them was about somebody who just disagreed, didn't they, with the feedback they'd got. And it was like, what training would you offer them? And it was this whole thing of sort of actually, was it factually correct or not? And is it subjective? So there's issues around that. Um, have you heard anything before about a psychological contract? No. You no. haven't. Yeah, you have. Um, so do you use it, Antonio, when you use it, do you use it for what counselling terms or are you using it as work in a work-based forum? 
Um, counseling based. Yeah, yeah. Go on then. So talk about it from a counseling perspective. So I, I, I think this is what it is. I hope it is what it is. So when, when a client comes in, obviously part of the contracting to begin with um, is, you know, to explain policies, to work around, you know, what are the boundaries, where, you know, what are the expectations, um, et cetera. So, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that you do it so explicitly when counselling contrasts very much with how it's done at work, because quite often, well, it's just often people do it and they come into a job with certain expectations. And some of them may have been explicit, but they might even have beliefs that if you work for JLI, you can work your way up very quickly. Or if you work for um, a sort of a university that you've got a job for life or whatever it is. But there are certain expectations that you come in with or one that's quite frequent for universities that they're going to fund you for doing a PhD so actually if you do it that you're going to have this um, fabulous access to ongoing development and more qualifications and things and it, it sometimes they are actually stated in an interview um, and you can always be missold uh, because actually if the budget changes you're not able to do that anymore um, or sometimes no one's actually said it to you, but it's what you believe to be true. And then if it doesn't come off, you feel deeply disappointed and it sort of breaks that level of trust. Um, so it's not written, it's not physically written into the contract, but it's a sort of an agreement. But it might not, as I say, it might not even be two way, which is why the contract that you're entering into with the counselling contract is explicit. The psychological one from a worker um, employer point of view isn't necessarily that defined which makes it really difficult and makes it one of the key reasons why people leave jobs because when that breaks when they feel the trust is gone and they um they haven't got what they were they felt like they were promised um has anyone had experience where they feel the psychological contract at, at work has been not been delivered on um i don't know about not being delivered on but I guess this sort of, I, I think I sort of, so uh, for example, there's something that me and Aid will start doing soon because he's coming to here. So it's basically we set up our boss for the day with a bit of like a pro rata of how the last 24 hours has been. But that's not actually part of the job role. That's just a bit of a gentleman's agreement that we'll do that for him. Is that sort of the same thing? Yeah, so it can be that, or it can, I think a good example is where you believe you were entitled to a promotion. You've had that where you yeah. lined up for a job and then come in and you're like, it still doesn't happen. Yeah, or yeah. that you believe that they're going to pay for you to do a degree or whatever it is that you... Don't get me started. I oh, know, I oh, know. <laughs> but it's that sort of thing that really grates on people because it's like, you promised me this. And the worst thing is, as I say, it might never have been said and it might have been said very lightly, but you really want to hear it. So you've just sort of agreed. And I think when Adrian spoke a couple of last week about a job that he had where I got the feeling he should have had the promotion and he didn't have the promotion. That was a breaking of the psychological contract, wasn't it? When someone who was less equipped got the job. Yeah, because I left. I know, because mm -hmm. that's what happens when the psychological contract because you feel like I'll tell you what you feel, well yeah it's been recorded but you feel like you've been shafted that's that's mm -hmm. really it um so you don't want to stay because you're like if they're going to treat me like that I'm off yeah, yeah. although you know in the counseling room that does happen quite a lot as well that's, you know the client might expect that you're going to be solving all of their problems oh, I said yeah so, you know it is part part of that psychological contracting is to set the stage and try to avoid it I suppose but it does happen all the time well, all the time, frequently yeah. anyway. Yeah. So, because of my um, slightly shite personal circumstances, I see a counsellor on a Friday afternoon. He was booking my next couple of sessions in. I said, Oh, but we don't need to go any further than that because you're going to fix me by then, aren't you? And he's like, 